Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast where we explore what is possible in the world of investing. If you've just joined us for the first time, a huge welcome. We have a massive episode today. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you? I'm very good, Bryce. Very excited for this episode. We've got a lot to cover. We've got some big news stories. We're going to talk about the wall of worry that the Australian stock market and the global stock market continues to climb. And Luke Larrative joins us for another Pimp My Portfolio. But before all of that, I just want you to stop. Okay. And I want you to take a deep breath. <laughs> okay. And I want you to imagine some calming music. Okay. We are one month, we're officially one month after the horror global bloodbath began. You wouldn't know it. Now, I just think it's worth us all stopping <laughs> and reflecting and thinking about where we are. So it was really the 31st of July that kicked off. So not quite a month, but call it a month. Couldn't wait to talk about this. Yes. Any longer. <laughs> uh, 31st of July in the States and then the 1st of August in Australia when yep. it kicked off. One week into my holiday in Bali. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now you're not allowed to go on any more holidays no. now. Um, over the next week, the market, both in Australia and in America, fell 6%. And we saw the headlines. One trillion mark wiped off the global stock market panic, recession fears, horror global bloodbath, like all of that language. But a month after, from like before it started falling, where do you think we are? We're almost at record highs, I know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, in, Austra yeah in, so, in Australia. So in Australia, we've almost fully recovered. Yeah. Where from that, when it started falling, we're down 0.4%. Mm. So call it flat. In America, in less than a month, since the world was crashing, we're up 2%. That's unbelievable. So I think it's just like, we don't need to dwell on this point. We've hit it a lot, but let's re let's take that deep breath and keep that perspective. It reminds me of an investing strategy I used to employ. Dollar cost averaging. No, no, no. Well, it, I used to employ uh, based off an interview we'd done with an expert. Now, apologies, I can't remember it because this was early, early days before I was really attuned to the dollar cost averaging approach. I was still putting money in more haphazardly. Okay. And his, um, his approach to making the most of drawdowns was to try and put the equivalent amount of money in as the drawdown if you had cash on the side. So let's say you have, I don't know, five grand sitting on the side and the market drops 5%. He's saying take 5% of your cash on the side and put it in. Yeah. If it drops 10, take 10. Uh, you can work it out yeah. from there. <laughs> now, not to impugn the originality of this unnamed expert, uh, but Morgan Housel has written an article on that um, and we can include it in the show notes. Oh, um, has he? Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. Okay, well, um, that would be handy because I did quite, I did find it a quite a methodical way of approaching these instances and yeah. I've found that since dollar cost aver averaging and nothing, and I'm, and I'm not regretful of this, but since dollar cost averaging, I haven't, taken the opportunity when the market falls six percent mm. to try and just top up a little a because i was on holidays in bali and my automated investing is doing the work for me and there are going to be situations where if that protraction goes for longer than it did i will benefit but because it was such a short moment in time really only a couple of days if you don't have a strategy i guess then yeah you may have missed out in inverted commas yeah yeah all right, well, look, that's our moment of reflection. Um, nice. Let's now hit the sting and get into the news of the day. News All right, Randall, let's start with America's September interest rate cut. It is all but guaranteed after the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said the time has come for policy to adjust. This has been like the biggest tease. <laughs> it's like been a slow build up. It's like the uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed have like nodded towards yeah, it yeah. and then they've like suggested they winked at yeah, it yeah and now Jerome Powell in a speech has said yeah quote the time has come for policy to adjust it is all but guaranteed yeah you'd uh you'd bet well I mean like plenty of people are betting on it yeah it would be kind of funny if they didn't. I know, it. <laughs> I know. It's like classic markets. But, but I think if you look at like what the recipe is for when it's time to cut rates, uh, in America, we have the economic growth slowing, like yep. GDP growth slowing. Um, inflation is back towards the 2% target. So inflation is really tamed. Uh, and then unemployment has ticked up marginally, but ticked up. Mm. So it's like the recipe 
the, the ingredients are there. All right, well, we'll be waiting. The next Federal Reserve meeting is September 17th and 18th. All eyes will be on them. Ren, Boeing. Oh, Boeing. Man, the, the bad news continues for Boeing. God. They're going to have to get bailed out from their NASA <laughs> so, from the space station. Well, let, let's just start with uh, Boeing. Most people are probably familiar with one of the two big air aircraft makers in the world alongside yep. uh, France's Airbus. Uh, Boeing is down 31% this year just because they've had disaster after disaster. The CEO got booted. Mm. New CEO started on the 8th of August. Um, he came in, uh, he, he's like an engineer's engineer. That's, that was his reputation. But look, he, the problems haven't stopped. Mm. Uh, you know, like they're legacy problems. Last week, issues with two separate aircrafts. Uh, they had to temporarily stop test flights of their 777X aircraft. And in the same week, uh, safety regulators in the US ordered inspections of their 787 Dreamliners. So two different plane models. But that was last week's news because this week's <laughs> yeah. news, uh, now it's their Starliner, which is their spacecraft. Yes. Now, for context, the last manned mission to the International Space Station the most recent one was two US astronauts who had an eight day trip yeah. up to the International Space Station. Yeah, in June or something. Yeah, yeah. they've now been there three months yeah. because the there's been like a problem. There's like, I think it's a hydrogen leak with Boeing's um, spacecraft. spacecraft. Yeah. The, was it the Starliner? Um, they've been trying to fix it, trying to fix it, trying to fix it. NASA have said yeah. enough. Now it's coming back to Earth to run further tests on the ground. And NASA have turned to SpaceX mm. and said, can you get go and get those astronauts <laughs> hopefully by February 2025? Yeah. So an eight-day trip to the International Space Station is now a six-month trip. Crazy. Yeah. So thank you to SpaceX, I think, for, uh, for being able to do that. But it would, I mean, it's yeah, pretty nuts to think that the, just I think the mentality of these um, guys going up there for eight days and having to now be there for eight months. Like, yeah. tough. So tough. tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not good news for Boeing. Yeah, and look, I think, you know, Boeing, are we, I think we said this when they first started falling. They're so dominant and so protected because, like, the, they're so strategically important to the US. But God, there would be some pressure to get things right. Absolutely, like, absolutely. It's, not, uh, it's not a Mr. Beat Up stock just yet. No. But I'm sure it, it might make the segment. Let's keep moving. Another headline that caught our attention, Australia's right to disconnect took effect this week, applying to all businesses with 15 or more employees. Mm, so unfortunately for our employees, you're going to keep pestering them at all <laughs> yes. hours of the day. <laughs> now, the right to disconnect, it doesn't mean that employers cannot contact their staff after hours it, as you keep telling us. as i keep telling you <laughs> it just means that staff can ignore the attempts at contact yes so this was to try and provide a little bit more life balance yeah. for uh, some of these employees and industries where it was almost common practice to be speaking and expecting uh, communication with staff at all hours yeah i think it's just a function of everyone having a phone now yeah which you know a generation ago wasn't a thing. Yeah. Uh, the the yeah. era of landlines, this wasn't a problem. Phone, emails. I remember when um, my wife was working during COVID at home and her boss sent around an email saying, you know what, guys, it's all right. I give permission for everyone to turn off their laptops at seven o'clock on Fridays. Okay. And she was like, this is even, this like... <laughs> but that's like big law firm life. Like, I know. And she's like, what is, what is this email? Like, just let us turn it off at five on a Friday. Come on. Well, no, you got to go. <laughs> You've chosen the, the wrong workplace if you want that. I know. Well, anyway. Yeah. And finally, Ren, uh, the federal opposition are going hard at big box retailers. First, we had the inquiry into the Aussie supermarkets, mm -hmm. Coles and Woolies. Now we've got the National Party pushing to expand the scope now into Bunnings. Yeah. They're in the firing line. And opposition leader Peter Dutton has accused big box retailers of price gouging, although he is yet to actually produce any specific evidence. I think that is an, import <laughs> an important point to make. Yeah, it's, I mean, Bunnings seems to be the one that's getting in the firing line, but in the articles, there's been like nods to Ikea and it's basically like any large retailer they're looking at. Yeah, um, yeah. It is an interesting dynamic that we're watching play out that mm. I think will ripple 
throughout politics for a long time to come. Mm. So it's worth paying attention to. Fun fact about Bunnings as we wrap up, you know how they have that, uh, if you find a cheaper price on a stocked item, we'll beat it by 10%. Yeah. Like it's so common that I could just yeah, rip yeah. that off, off the top of my head. The, their neat little trick that they do, which is completely within their right to do, is the vast majority of the things that they range are uh, like only Specific, ranged at Bunnings yeah, or yeah. home brand. Yeah. So you won't be able to find yeah, it listed find anywhere it else. Yeah. 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 Smart marketing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Good on them. Uh, now, if you're looking to keep up with the headlines, make sure you signed up to our daily newsletter. You can find a link in the show notes to do so. We'll send you what is important in the world of business and news every day, as well as some questions answered by experts from the community. So right at the top, you spoke about the rebound that we've just experienced and how we're almost at all time highs. So we thought it was a good reminder to revisit how the stock market is A, the greatest wealth creating machine in history, despite the wall of worry that it has faced time and time again over the last 100 plus years. Yeah, now there's two parts to this segment that we want to do. The first is, I guess, short term. And then we want to zoom out a bit, a little bit. But let's start short term because over the past five years, there's been plenty of reasons to panic. COVID, yep. obviously, uh, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, inflation hitting 7.9% in Australia or 7.8%, uh, the war in the Middle East, um, the slowing economy, the cost of living crisis. Have I missed Bombers anything? not making the finals yeah. year on year. <laughs> oh, China's continued economic yes, slowdown. China bombing out. The collapse of the iron ore price and the lithium price and yeah. the nickel price, yeah. like a, a lot of Australian minerals. Um, there is a lot of reasons to panic. Yes. But in that time, in the past five years, the ASX 200 accumulation index, which is an index that measures the ASX 200 with dividends reinvested, yep. up 48%. Nice. Despite the COVID crash, despite the fall in 2022, 2023, just the vanilla ASX 200 with dividends reinvested, $100 invested is now $150. This is just a bulldozer that continues to smash through any wall of worry. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's that just... meme with the train. You know, the, the meme I know what with you're the saying, train. Yeah, but keep going, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, it's like the, it's the bus parked the on bus, the track yeah, is worried. The bus parked on the track the is worried. And then the ASX200 yes, is, is, okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll get that off on our socials. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, please go to our Instagram and like it because <laughs> we're going to need... That'll be the first and last time I'll ever speak about a meme on this show. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to keep doing it. But look, we... Um, we wanted to zoom out a little bit more because that narrative applies the longer you zoom out as well. So let's zoom out a long way. 122 years because market index have um, the Australian All Ordinaries Index going back to 1900. Nice. So 1900 to 2023. What do you think the stock market has done annually on average? I know the answer to this okay, well, because we've been <laughs> rinsing it for years. 13.2%. 13.2%. Unbelievable. 13.2%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is climbing a wall of worry. Mm. Two global pandemics, two world wars, plenty of smaller wars, um, a prime minister going missing, a prime minister being dismissed, yeah. um, companies collapsing. You name you it. You name it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, let's zoom in on some of the insights that we can learn from this data. And we'll include the uh, source in the show notes as well. So you can uh, look at it yourself. But what, what can we learn? I think the first learning is the headline, the negative headlines always outweigh the positive in everyone's minds, but the stats are different. 23 negative years out of those 122. So 19%. 99 positive years, yes. 81%. A great reminder of the reason to stay invested. If you try and play the market, you will miss some of those years. The worst year was 2008, down 40%, global financial crisis, mm -hmm. no surprises there. The second worst year was 1930, down 28%. Great depression. Yeah. Um, the best year was 1983, up 67%, but that came after two down years, 1981 and 1982. 
Similar, the second best year was uh, 1975, up 66%. That came after 73 and 74, which were both down years. So if we just reflect on that for a second, um, uh, 81 and 82, both down, and then 83, best year ever. 73 and 74, both down. 75, second best year ever. This is like the peril of trying to time the market mm. because so many people try and get out on the way down and say, I'll wait until it's better to get back in. Yeah. But whether it's a short, sharp correction like we saw you know, this month yeah. or you know, the COVID rebound was super quick. But even here, it's like you, two you years have two, of down. two years of down. So you're yeah. waiting, you're waiting, you're piling up your cash, sitting on the sideline and then bang, bang. it yeah. rips. And you never know that it's ripping, ripping until yeah. like you're in it. Yeah. And so, so many people miss the recovery yeah. and that's a real problem. Yeah. And to, Not to, only the recovery, the best two years in 122. Yeah. Like. And, and to, put, to put that in context, so uh, inflation peaked in Australia at like 17.5%, I think 17.7% in 1975. So it's not like we were, th that, you know, people were thinking, economic conditions are good the mm, market's mm, gonna rip it's mm. inflation is incredibly high like think mm. about how we were what we were like when it was 7.8 percent we didn't know that was the peak we didn't know we were out of the woods we felt like we were in the shit mm, it's only mm. in hindsight you look back and you're like that, that would have been a good peak. time to yeah, yeah yeah and that is the story over and over again and that is why we say it's such a difficult thing and such a perilous thing to try and time the market yeah stay invested so those are the highlights, but there are some pr surprising positive years among those 99. So World War I, 1914, 1917, and 1918 were actually positive years. Mm, you wouldn't think that. You wouldn't think that. World War II, 1939, 40, 42, 43, 44, and 45 were positive years. Wouldn't think that. Harold, Harold Holt goes missing. Yeah, 1967. <laughs> up 43%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whitlam dismissed in 1975, market up 63%. They love that. Quintex collapse. Now, this was one of Christopher Scase's companies. I think his, yeah. The, the one company. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was in 1989. The market was up 17%. And in 2001, HIH, which was the largest corporate collapse in Australian history, uh, and also one tell, uh, the market was up ten percent. Yeah, yeah. So despite and also all of that, nine eleven, I guess at the end of the year. The world wars really surprised me. I get, yeah, economic activity, perhaps. I'm not sure. Like, well, yeah, they, people say like war is good for business yeah. and all of that stuff, and yeah. you know, like especially in a situation like that, like you very quickly get to total employment and yeah. total, yeah. Um, well, Everyone's like, yeah, like the, the whole economy becomes it's active. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that the point we're trying to make here is that the history of the stock market is a history of climbing a wall of worry. Mm. And companies collapse, prime ministers get dismissed or go missing, wars happen, inflation spikes. There's always a reason not to invest. There's always a reason to wait. I think I used this example on the podcast recently, but I'm going to recycle it. Warren's Buff Warren Buffett's dad only invested in gold because he was so worried about the US economy and the US dollar. What did he miss out on? And then compare that to what his son has yeah, done yeah. by just backing, in his case, his home country, like America's entrepreneurial spirit and yeah, enterprise. Yeah. It's just... Um, stay invested. Yeah, stay invested. Stay invested. Yeah. I think we've Forget made that Forget the point. noise yeah. and let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we head to a break, we want to let you know that all of our podcasts plus a lot more are now available on YouTube. So if you head to the Equity Mates YouTube channel, you'll find everything we do there plus a lot more. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Here's a little tease. I am writing a script for a YouTube only video on how Rio Tinto has found itself in the middle of two <laughs> great power struggles, the US and Russia, and Europe and China. Well, there so you go. that's YouTube a little tease. Exclusive. Head over to YouTube. <laughs> YouTube exclusive. All right, now we're going to take a very quick break. And on the other side, we'll be back with a Pimp My Portfolio with Luke and a community member. It is time for... This is Pimp My Portfolio. Pimp My Portfolio. 
All right. Well, welcome to Pimp My Portfolio, that time where we bring in an expert and a community member to get their portfolio pimped. We have our expert, Luke Larity from Seneca. Luke, how are you? Bryce, how are you, mate? Ren? Hi, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Good. Ren's here as well. I'm just imagining Luke as exhibit from Pimp My Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. He's got a lot more hair than I Yeah, do. yeah, true. Uh, true. And we have our community member today uh, submitting their portfolio. It is Holly. Holly, welcome to Equity Mates. Hello, thanks for having me, guys. Super looking forward to it. Now, Ren, as always, what have we got in Holly's portfolio? Yeah, so Holly's portfolio is anchored by some big ETF positions. Uh, the Beta Shares Diversified All Growth ETF, uh, iShares S&P 500, and iShares Global 100. Uh, together, they make 75% of the portfolio. So a big core position. Uh, and then around that, there's uh, a, a few... Uh, individual stocks, uh, BHP about 10%, Woolworths about 5%, and then Northern Star Resources, Pilbara Minerals, uh, Woodside, uh, so a few uh, resources companies, and then finally Appen. So that's the portfolio. Uh, Luke, what's the uh, nickname? Uh, the nickname for Holly's portfolio is What Happened, Holly? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Did you say what happened? What happened? happened. What happened? What happened? Yeah, I love a pun. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's bad. That's oh, really bad. Um, so context here. Well, Holly, how about you talk us through the portfolio and yeah. and and uh, yeah, maybe shed some light on why you think Luke's given that name. <laughs> I mean, I love a good pun. Um, it can't be as bad as Luke's infamous all punt, no process nickname. <laughs> <laughs> is that getting a run, is it? Is that, uh, 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 your reputation proceeds. <laughs> oh, okay, good. I like it. <laughs> Putting the fear of God into the equity mates um, community. Literally. <laughs> yeah, the app end, to be honest, that is a terrible way to start, but that was actually my very first investment. Oh, lovely. Um, That's what we made, like to see. Yes. That was a good start. Um, so classic first mistake. Um, I just heard about it on the grapevine, did none of my own research, um, you know, lost pretty much all my money in that. Can you just tell me, like, just because I think it'd be interesting for people, what would be like your one or two like key takeaways from like the experience of buying a share and like logging on every other day or whatever and seeing it like go down and down and worrying and like what what is some of the like maybe emotional or behavioral things that you've kind of like learned about yourself during that process yeah so um that pretty much was the start of my investing journey was putting a thousand dollars in Athen and just watching it go down um, yes. so <laughs> i was like this is fun <laughs> <laughs> We're not laughing at you, we're laughing because we've all done it. No, it's yeah. A, yeah. Yes, I know. It's such a classic. Um, so I actually bought Appen purely because my boyfriend had it. So full disclosure to his portfolio, uh, he always tells me to do my own research and uh, he never gives me any stock tips. I picked this one all on my own. Um, Surprise, he's still your boyfriend. It... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, shout out to him for this one. But... Um, yeah, watching it go down every day, I, I I guess it just shows I didn't really do my own research in the company. So I always just kind of held on to that hope that it would it would come back. Um, but then again, I don't know enough about the company to know whether or not it will come back. Um, it's honestly still in my portfolio because I'm a bit slack. Um, I haven't sold any shares ever. I've just always just held. Um, and I guess it's just a daily reminder of, not to invest in things you don't yeah, know Yeah, keep about. it in there, <laughs> daily reminder. Look, yeah. <laughs> asterisks, asterisks, general advice, general advice, but like it is almost the 30 June and if you were yes. looking to take a uh, sell a share, now is not a bad time yes. to do that if it's not a... There's asterisks, honestly, asterisks, asterisks, I don't asterisks. think you guys... Yes. No, I don't think you guys get actual dollar values in there, but there is such a minimal amount that I just don't care anymore. So, yeah, I pretty much already have nice. lost all my money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. Most, of, most of them lose it at the tax department, I suppose, is probably what I'm trying to say as well. I yeah, think... Because um, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you sell it and you claim that loss, it can offset a capital gain. Correct. Right? Yeah. So that's the... Yes. There's still value in the loss. And, and the losses carry forward. Yeah. So it's yeah. a... You know, you don't have to use yeah. it this year. You can use it next year or year after or whatever. So, oh. Holly, I want to I yeah. make you feel a bit better because uh, I had exactly the same first experience with you. I put my first $1,000 into a company. Uh, it was Slater & Gordon and I actually lost uh, 
or so much money that I couldn't even cover the brokerage to sell it. So um, I <laughs> somehow did worse than you. But to make matters worse, as it was falling, I had internalized that idea of buy low, sell high. So I, as it was falling, I put more into it. <laughs> so trust me, however bad you're feeling, you still could have done worse. Oh. I, could ra- I could rattle off but, 10 okay. like that. But, yeah, but, but I think for me, the big takeaway for both of you is that uh, it wasn't a moment where you said investing is not for me. I'm yeah. out. I'm out for yeah. good. Yes, Ren, like that. Ren, yeah, Ren like subsequently that. went to make uh, went to make some great investments, and uh, Holly, it looks like you're certainly well on your way to um to creating a, a pretty decent core portfolio. So, so Luke, mm-hmm. um, what, what are your initial thoughts here? Again, I'll just do the stocks quickly because it's um, kind of boring. Who cares what my opinion of stocks are? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's literally that's why, why you're here. Yeah, but like, it's just, you know, like, everyone's got a different view. You know, I could talk you through the thesis, but it's kind of too long. Um, so, look, we don't mind. We're worse for a trade at the moment. We bought that not too long ago um, after the, you know, pretty average results. Um, I think it looks cheap and uh, obviously reasonable business, sort of semi-monopoly type vibes. So... Don't mind that at these prices. We are very long Pilbara Minerals. So I think it's my second biggest weight in the Seneca Australian shares, large cap SMA at the moment. Um, so we like that. We like lithium. If you want to read more, read my lithium thesis, just Google Luke Larrity and lithium. You'll find a thousand articles. Um, Northern Star seems a bit expensive to me for gold exposure at the moment. Um, that being said, they're all kind of expensive on the ASX. So don't ask me for an alternative. Uh, wood, Woodside's a bit of a mess. Um, it's kind of got flat sales growth forecasts out into the future. Kind of trying to do some Fugazi renewable energy thing that's not really kind of working. So um, their best assets are now uh, fully exploited. So I would argue, what are they going to do next? Um, anyway, that's the stocks app and you know the drill. I don't, you don't need me to tell you about that. Hang on. Firstly, oh, Holly, yeah. what I reckon you do is internalize those... Um, sort of one-liners on each of those. And then when you're at dinner with your boyfriend tonight, don't tell you're on with Luke <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just yeah. spit out some facts about these portfolios, <laughs> about these companies. <laughs> oh All right, God, so, I'm sure he'll be impressed. <laughs> so what do you think about the exposure? That oh, BHP is the other one, sorry. BHP. Yeah, yeah. BHP we own, we're underweight. Um, so I kind of think that's a little bit expensive, but I think the Anglo deal is a good, is a good deal. Um, the market won't like it, but on a three-year view, that'll work out the best for them. Um, and the Anglo's got some some kick-ass assets. So, okay, so that's that. Uh, on the ETFs, I think that there's overlap. We always kind of bang on about overlap in ETFs. Um, and probably given your other ETF hold- holdings, you know, beta shares, diversified or growth would probably cover, I think, all those. That's like a, just an equity only, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Global, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that would cover your S&P 500 and your global 100 stocks. Um, so all, mm-hmm. you're do- all you're doing there by adding those two extra is like overweighting large cap relative to sort of mid cap and small cap. Um, so I would probably not do that, um, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. And, and so Holly, just uh, or for people listening at home who are just wondering, um, the beta shares diversified all growth is basically the global stock market. The S&P 500 is the US stock market. Global 100 is 100 big multinational companies. But the fact of the matter is, these days, the top of those indexes are all the same big tech companies. In similar weights. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so you could probably just reduce your admin and hassle and yeah, just own like the diversified or growth or um, you know, any, of, any other of the you know, all-world stock market index type ETFs that are out there. They're, they're all much the same. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, my thoughts. And if you just mm-hmm. if you just wanted to run a portfolio that just invested in that beta shares diversified or growth or equivalent, um, that would be totally fine. Mm-hmm. There is no reason you need to do anything else. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to run off and have a little dabble in a bit of Woolworths or whatever on the side, all power to you if that's what you know if, you know gets you excited in the morning. Um, but you don't have to do that. You, mm-hmm. You're totally fine just doing the the you know ETF yeah. ETF dance. Mm. 
And then the age-old mm-hmm. conundrum of selling down those ETFs, taking into consideration. I'm tax surprised the equity mates community knows what sell means. There's no, no one, <laughs> oh, no one, no one oh, seems to know how to sell in this community. Holly said she's never, never sold, sold anything. I know. Oh, yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I don't even know. No one knows yeah, where the red button Holly, is. Just keep like clicking. It's, I'm on that vibe as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm off this Holly hard. I'm off this that hard. Need a bit of valuation discipline. Beat into the equity mates community. <laughs> but the um, no, nah, look, I do um, on the direct stuff. Uh, there is the right time to sell some of those stocks, um, probably mm-hmm. beyond the scope of today's conversation. But um, certainly, you can just use the blue button, the buy button on the stuff like beta shares, diversified high growth, and or uh, all growth, sorry. And, um, and but the shares, you know, if you're going to buy shares, you're buying them to sell them. That's why you, you know. So even if it is five years down the road when the earnings have quadrupled, um, there is a price, mm-hmm. and they will trade. At an, at, a, at, a, at an overpriced level at some point. I think the the big takeaway is, you know, like the, you're certainly on the right track. What Bryce said earlier about, um, you know, picking yourself up from the app and experience and keep going, like that's something to be commended. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. uh, a lot of people start with like a, they've heard Core and Satellite and they start it, but they end up having a long list of shares and, you know, not that much in ETFs. So I think the fact that you've got sort of 75% of your money in core ETFs and you're mm. dabbling on the side, like you're, the, the building blocks are, are emerging and they look pretty good. So. As long as you know that dabbling mm-hmm. on the side is is probably reducing your returns. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, in the long yeah. run. And well, that's, and that's the of, that's the reality. I started backwards. So we spent so much time chatting about Appen, which is like my biggest fail. But um, it was only after buying like, uh, the shares that I read the boys books I did more research and then I discovered the whole core concept um, so during COVID I just dawdled pretty much the whole time with the money in my bank account um, I knew I had to do a core but it was like just totally analysis paralysis on all the ETFs yeah. and it's only really in the last 12-ish months that I committed to building um, what looks like an overlapping core so I will adjust no, <laughs> you know, no, you, no you look it's, it's yeah, not yeah. don't don't stress about it right but I think, I mean, look, if you never did anything about it, it's not really a big issue. Yeah. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, look, I, I think a lot of people we speak to seem to do this. They go, the, they buy the shares first. That was our story. And then that, yeah. yeah and, yeah, and yeah, I, I obviously um, have never graduated to the ETFs. So, um, we'll get you one day. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, I think that's totally reasonable. I, I would just think about getting as much money invested in your optimal portfolio as soon as you can. Mm-hmm. And as soon as as, yeah. as reasonable, and yeah. uh, both from a mental freedom perspective, and really having confidence and um, conviction in what you're doing, and not being, you know, and also from a maximising your compounding on a risk adjusted basis. Yeah. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. we even speak in the book. If it's not DHHF, the diversified all growth, it's the Vanguard one, which is VHT. But they're designed to be the one stop shop. Yeah. Like there is nothing mm. nothing wrong with having. As you said, Luke, that that is a portfolio. And there's, you know, the I just there's iShares, there's Van Eck versions, there's Global X versions. Like, you know, you can you can pick your poison, right? There's, do your research and suss out what you think the best deal is. But um, uh, they all work. There's no difference between them. And I think for the beginner investors, and people just getting started out, they get this analysis paralysis that that um, Holly's talking about, comparing ETFs and looking at the historical returns. Like the historical returns don't mean anything right it's complete for gut don't worry about them that what matters is the process mm-hmm. that goes into them and how they're put together so holly uh, a lot of information we've thrown at you we appreciate you um talking us through the portfolio today any uh final questions for luke before we wrap it up uh no i'm pretty much happy with everything you said i mean i totally agree um i think yeah the dollar cost averaging into dhhf for the rest of my life like it just seems so like why doesn't everyone else do it i don't know like i think i started off <laughs> we really ask complicated. ourselves the yeah, same yeah. question bryce why don't you do it i pretty much do, <laughs> do it i do <laughs> I, I think i think holly to, to answer your question um uh, they're, they're pretty new products in the scheme of things mm. like um you know even when bryce and i started investing etfs were a tiny part of the market yep. and a lot of the products we talk about today didn't exist so you know, we've kind of all grown up um, with these products coming to market and getting more exposure. So, um, also just like a national obsession with housing and like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. A, so many reasons Pe- that people, people love punting on stocks. Yeah, but yeah, you make a lot of money punting on stocks. Sometimes yeah. it's a pretty easy thing to sell to people. Yeah, but yeah, in terms of you know why didn't we learn about it when we were kids and 
you know, that's why weren't that how previous generations invested? It wasn't really available to them. Mm. So we're pretty lucky that we're investing in this moment when technology's brought costs down and we can take advantage of it. Yeah. And what you've identified is yep. right. Like what it, it's just so straightforward and simple. It seems too easy. It seems too yeah. easy, yeah. But like <laughs> that's the beauty of it. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately the you know, the, the world I operate in lives on uh, creating unnecessary complexity to extract a living for themselves. Mm. So, you know, there is really simple answers out there. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the very best answer. Can you do better than that? Mm. Yeah, I think you can do better than that. And, and, you know, that's what I do for a living every day. But that being said, is that totally fine? Mm. Yes, it is totally passable. It's totally, but is it better than buying a portfolio of 30 ASX listed companies by a country mile? So, you know, it's a, is it better than buying a lick? Yeah, way, 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 way better than buying a listed investment <laughs> company. So um, but that, that's kind of my view. And I think the guys are, are doing a great job of promoting that, that message as well. Mm. The question is, is it enough? Mm-hmm. And the answer to that is yes. So we'll wrap there. Uh, Holly, thank you so much for taking your time to submit your portfolio, come on the show and share your journey with the Equimates community and with Luke. No, thank you guys so much for having me. When I heard that I was getting uh, Luke, I thought I was going to be in for a fat roast, but no, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> Look, behind the scenes, Luke is actually really nice. I so. love the fact that everyone's scared. It's yeah. kind of exactly where I want them all. It's exactly oh, where I want no. them all. No, Maybe we should have a new no, segment. No, thanks a lot. Fat roast. No worries, Holly. Equity I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. 